Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. We hope you're doing well. Do us a favor. That would help us do well, and that is make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Turn on that auto download. That way, every time we have a new show, guess what? You just It's right there on your phone, whatever device you're listening to us on, which most of the data says your phone or your car. Let us know, and uh, we will make sure you know when we have a new episode. Uh, it's Scott Branson joined by my partner, Mo Moten. Mo is the senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report, also a Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com, where you can also catch my work as well. So thank you guys all for being with us here. We got lots to talk about today with the Raiders. First, Mo, let's a uh, quick reaction. Uh, the AFC NFC championship game we saw on Sunday. Um, I was surprised and not surprised with the AFC side. Uh, I, I think I told you last week, I said on my other show, the not zone that, you know, it's hard for me to, to count out Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs. And sure enough, they go in there and Lamar Jackson doesn't have a great game. The coaching staff for the Ravens inexplicably pretends like they didn't know what got them there. But give me your reaction to that game first. Uh, to me, it was a separation from the really good young teams and the perennial Super Bowl contenders. Uh, yeah. I, I feel like the young teams in the in both of the matchups made critical errors. And when I say teams, I don't, I'm not saying just the players, but as you mentioned, the coaching staffs, I think – with the Ravens, it was you should have ran the ball more. It seems like Lamar was one reluctant to run the ball because he wanted to show that he can throw. Because a lot of people have been calling him a running quarterback. I think I don't. I'm not saying I'm not in his head, but it seemed <laughs> like that was the issue there. And Todd Monken forgetting about as you said how Ravens got there, and part of it was running the ball. Now I know Lamar Jackson had an MVP caliber season, but. You got to run the football, especially because that was one of the Chiefs' weaknesses coming into this game was that they are success susceptible to the run, and the Ravens were unwilling to do that. And 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 an unbalanced attack helped the Chiefs out. With the Lions, it was more the coaching. Uh, I yeah. know a lot of people say it's Monday morning quarterback to not criticize Dan Campbell, but I've been critical of Dan Campbell before. Yes. I don't know if you remember that game against the Dallas Cowboys where he went for that two point try fifty eight times. Yeah. I said, at some point, Dan Campbell, I understand aggressiveness, but you have to contextualize the situation. And sometimes your philosophy is your philosophy, but you, sometimes you have to be flexible with whatever your philosophy is. Absolutely. And thank you for your uh, your tweet of Bruce Lee. Um, uh, saying, <laughs> I loved it. Uh, but no, I mean, see, that's the thing, though, like with Dan Campbell. Well, you live by the sword, die by the sword. I said that, too. But um, it's sort of like, well, that's what got them there. Well, not necessarily that's what got them. Yes, you take calculated risks. And I get it. You want to be a little more of a gambler there, right? Okay, fine. That's fine. But it's the NFC championship game. Okay. It, it, and and if you have people, I, I saw Albert Breer tweet out, oh, everybody's criticizing him and it's what got them there and, and blah, blah. It's like, no, but here's the deal. Situations are different. Yes, you can be aggressive, but you have to always base your decisions on the situation. So in the regular season, yeah, you're fighting for a playoff spot. I get that. But once you're in the tournament, Mo, and now you're a game away from the Super Bowl, you gotta think. You gotta. You gotta say, okay. Usually, this is what I would do. Is this the right time to do what I'd usually do, or do I maybe take a different approach? And obviously, Dan Campbell just went with it. Um, but as you said, he's actually had decisions like that before. We saw, and Raider fans know very well, we saw um, Brandon Staley with the Chargers who did it so much that he ended up screwing his, himself and his career, okay? Because he would just do it, you know, third down, second quarter, we're up by 10 points, I'm going to go for it on fourth down on my own 30. Like, it, it doesn't make sense. So so I agree with you there. And then on the Lamar Jackson thing, I just want to say this too, because you know I've always talked about how much I like Lamar Jackson. And the MVP war, before you guys start going nuts about that, the MVP war is for the regular season. And I got no problem with Lamar Jackson winning it for the regular season. But I think what separates very good quarterbacks, and there's been lots of them in the NFL, from great quarterbacks is winning the big games, right? Now, and I'm not talking about the Super Bowl. I'm talking about games to get you there because there's plenty of great Hall of Fame quarterbacks that have, have gone to the Super Bowl and not won one. Don't, they don't have a ring. But I think this is where Lamar Jackson will continue to have detractors. Not saying it's all fair, but he will continue to have detractors until he wins a big game. I was going back and forth with somebody, you'll appreciate this real quick before we get into the Raiders here, folks, because we will, um, is I had somebody going a little bit back and forth friendly-wise, 
yesterday uh, on this, and he's like, well, you know, every quarterback, even Tom Brady had a bad game. And it's like, okay, so I look back, Tom Brady, so, so Lamar Jackson's two and four in playoff games. Tom Brady was 10 and 0 to start his career at playoffs. 10 and 0. So, I don't, yes, Tom Brady, of course, he's had bad games. But at the prime of your career, early of your career, when you have championship squads, you have to just do it. You just have to win. And he wasn't able to do it. So, it is what it is. The, 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 the AFC is going to continue to be a juggernaut, right? And um, if Lamar Jackson wants to reach that next level, because uh, he's an amazing player, He's going to have to get past that hump, and they just haven't been able to do it. But not all his fault. Like you said, the coaching. I, I don't understand. I don't understand how John Harbaugh doesn't overrule his offensive coordinator and say, what the hell are you doing? Why are not we not running the ball? Zay Flowers. It's, Zay Flowers in the fumble. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's a, rook, he's a rookie, and then the penalty he had. Yeah, the taunting. You know, it, there, it, it, for, for a John Harbaugh team, it was very different because right. usually they're pretty disciplined. Mm -hmm. And that's, right. that's what I was going to point out. If, if Zay Flowers scores that touchdown, Different game. You know, the, the, you know, the Ravens were gaining momentum. We're gonna and we're gonna tie this to the Raiders in a minute, but yes, the Raider the Ravens were gaining momentum. Zay Flowers has that fumble at the goal line, and that's why I think Bill I think it said that Bill Belichick teaches his players not to lunge at the goal line because things like that can happen. Right. Leave your feet and don't lunge because you increase the probability of you uh fumbling the football. And that was just a momentum killer right there. So I I, I what I will say is Lamar Jackson's playoff issues are more comparable to Peyton Manning. If you remember Peyton Manning, mm -hmm. go out for Peyton Manning to get to and win the big game because he constantly had to feud with Tom Brady and that Patriots <laughs> dynasty. And I think Lamar Jackson is going to do the same thing with the Chiefs who have their little dynasty, dynastic run going on right now. So if the Raiders want to get there, people, yeah, the Raiders are going to have to get their quarterback. Can't win just off of defense. Look at the teams that are, that are in, that are in, that were in yesterday that are in the Super Bowl right now. I know people have their issues with Brock Purdy, but you need a quarterback one that's not that's a little above serviceable and two that has mobility because we saw it in every game with the exception of Jared Goff, quarterbacks using their functional mobility and that's why I've been preaching all off season for the Raiders to get in it with their new quarterback. Yes, and this is what we call a professional segue. Thank you, Will. <laughs> uh, but yes, and by the way, please stop arguing with me that the Raiders have their quarterback. They don't need to get one because people are telling me that I. I just can't. And you know how much Mo and I like Aiden O'Connell. We've talked nicely about him. We even made a T-shirt with his nickname. I mean, look, we like Aiden O'Connell. But stop. Just stop that, that, that Michael Jordan meme, right? Just stop. Stop. He, he will compete for the job. You're not giving right. him the job. He will compete for the job and he'll no, probably be but, a backup. But Mo, I'm sorry. Unless unless God himself, and maybe he will decide to do this, God himself comes down and and changes his physical makeup. He is not the guy who's going to lead you for the next 10 years. Not going to happen. Just, it's not, well, he can learn athleticism. Uh, Really? No, can't. Sorry. He can learn footwork. He can learn technique. He can get better. No question. But you can't suddenly be one kind of athlete and wake up and be another one. You just can't do it. All right? So not going to happen. Anyway, so let's get into our discussion today, which is the Raiders blueprint for 2024 and the state of the roster and uh, the biggest needs that they have on offense and defense. And Mo, we just talked about it, the qu quarterback. And I want to – I'm going to flash this up on the screen um, and show folks this, which is um, – uh, the roster needs, uh, which is number one. You see that number one, Mo? What does that say? Looks like quarterback. Yes, thank you. Okay. Quarterback, <laughs> and then I have, and this is my rankings. I saw some other rankings online as I was researching um, that that put some put defensive tackle above quarterback. I mean, anyway, but we'll, we'll look at that later. Quarterback, off, def, offensive line, defensive tackle, so interior defensive line still. Cornerback, and I think I, I, I might even put cornerback second now that I think about it running back, and wide receiver. And we'll get to wide receiver in a second because the Raiders have, even though they have Devontae Adams and even though Jacoby Myers did well, they have one of the slowest wide receiving cores in the NFL. Okay? So just that's is that's fact. So we got to look at that. But you look at this list, Mo, and you see quarterback, offensive line, defensive tackle, cornerback. So we're going to start. Now, I want to say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a tease here. To, or excuse me. On Thursday, our entire show is going to be mostly about, with the exception of the mailbag, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be about quarterbacks. Okay. So we're, we're going to talk about quarterbacks today, 
but we're going to go in depth on them on Thursday. So if we if we just kind of gloss over this a little bit, because Mo and I have been beating the drum on the quarterback thing, then you understand why. But we'll get into these positions, Mo. So you think about quarterback, we've seen what's happened over the course of these playoffs, what these quarterbacks have been able to do. And, you know, spare me this. Well, there's 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 lots of pure pocket passer NFL quarterbacks that are successful right now. No, there's not. I don't know what people are watching. Are they watching old NFL films or what are they doing? Mm-hmm. Anyway, so we look at the quarterback position and um, uh, I did a video last week, got a lot of heat for it because I said, hey, what we should do if I'm the Raiders and I'm the GM, I'm saying, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, what we should do, I said what they should do is they should, of course, draft a quarterback. No question. They have to draft a quarterback. If that's in the first round, great. If they can trade up, great. Going to be very hard. Great. But they also need to go get another veteran. And you and I have talked about this many times on the show. If Justin Fields is available for a third round draft pick, let's say, I say go get him. That's what I said in there. And people tell me how bad Justin Fields is. And that he's in. he's going into year four and he still sucks. And I'm like, yeah, well... And I brought up, I said, well, Jim Plunkett was in year nine when he became the quarterback of the Raiders and turned it around. So you may say, oh, it doesn't happen anymore, though, (laughs) moving the goalposts. So, but my discussion around that is you don't know what's going to happen, but I think the Raiders need that. They have Aiden O'Connell there. So he's there. He's in the mix. He's going to compete for the starting job. But I think you got to have two other people in that room. One has to be a rookie and the other has to be a veteran. Justin Fields would be someone I'd be interested in if I were them. If not him, someone else. It's just not a very deep market out there. It's not a deep market. What I will say about Justin Fields is I, I've been talking about Justin Fields for feels like months. Um, months, yeah. And I, and, I, and I don't know how much more clear I can make the Justin Fields point <laughs> because I, I think that the detractors are saying that you want Justin Fields to be the starter and the solution for the Raiders quarterback position for the long term, and that's not the case. Yep. Nope. My point here is Justin Fields is an option. He'll compete along with Aiden O'Connell and rookie for the starting job. May the best man win. Now you brought up Jim Pluckett. Now I don't even have to go that you know to that case mm-hmm. where Jim Pluckett you know just exploded in, in in later in his career. But I mean, look at Geno Smith. Yeah. Started off in a bad situation with the Jets. Was was comeback player of the year last year, and got the Seattle Seahawks to the playoffs. Again, I'm not saying Geno Smith is the answer in Seattle, right. but he he's a serviceable, high-end bridge quarterback that can win you some games, right? Mm-hmm. Baker Mayfield, you know, turned his career around in Tampa Bay. Now he's losing an offensive coordinator, but you look at him, he had a career rebirth, and he's probably yeah. going to get an extension in Tampa Bay. How long did it take him after being the number one overall pick in 2018 to have hit one of his best years. Sometimes it just takes the right situation. That's there it. are, there are some people who aren't just aren't good at the position. There are some people who just need a better situation. And I always say this, I, I want to see a quarterback in two different situations before I say, oh, he's a first round with, he's a bust, he's this, he's that, because he may have just landed in a bad situation in Chicago because I ask this question again. When's the last time the Chicago Bears have developed a quarterback, a a franchise? When's the last time they've had a franchise quarterback? Just look at their history of developing quarterbacks. It isn't good. It's terrible. So yeah. I, I just I, I want to see Justin Fields get a second chance somewhere else before I write him off. And I think he's a he could be a decent option. Yeah, it's amazing to me too, because because play especially playing quarterback in the NFL in today's NFL, it's the most difficult position there is, right? So you you everything is on your shoulders. You have to do it. And oh, he holds the ball too long. Yes, there are some things. I mean, if you read the scouting report, the thing is, I watched a lot of the games. You know, you and I can get access. We can watch film. I can watch condensed games. I can see every snap he's taken. A lot of folks will judge that based on highlights they see on TV, and I get that. And and he's had bad games. But I go back, you, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned um, um, Baker Mayfield. Drew Brees, when he was a Charger, was okay, wasn't great. And then he goes to New Orleans and the right system, what happens? He becomes a Hall of Famer. Well, Drew Brees was great when he started. No, he wasn't. It took him year four. So there's a lot of revisionist history. People think about players, and, and not just Justin Fields, other people, people too, at quarterback. It's like some guys just take a little bit. Rich Gannon, one, one of the one of the quarterbacks Raider Nation loves the most. Same thing. So it takes time. And the thing is, the important thing is exactly what you said, which is you and I are not sitting here 
and saying Justin Fields is the answer as the franchise quarterback. He could be, outside chance, but he could be. If not, you bring him in, it costs you $6 million. If it doesn't work out, you let him go. All it did was cost you a third-round draft pick. So I look at that and I say, okay, that's a viable option, especially when you look at other people on the board. Jacoby Brissett, you kind of know what you have with him, aging a little bit too. So there's nothing great out there. The only other options are Kirk Cousins. He's going to be too expensive. He probably doesn't want to go to Las Vegas anyway. And I don't think that's the answer for them long term anyway. So you look at that and you say, okay, let's look at our options. Um, and then, Mo, we get to, I think, other key areas of need here. Oops, sorry. There we go. Offensive line and defensive tackle. Let's kind of talk about those quickly in tandem, which is the the idea that the Raiders, we know uh, Andre James is a, is a free agent. We know Jermaine Illuminor is a free agent. We know they need to improve up there as well, especially if they're going to get a young quarterback. Um, you got to do that through the draft, of course, but there are some free agents available up front as well. Um, you look at their situation there, and I think it's a little more dire because of the free agent situation too. You knew what you had with the other guys, not saying it was perfect, but now you kind of look at that. You look at Greg Van Roten also going to be a free agent. There's going to be a lot of changes up front. Yeah, I wrote about this and talked about this in my Bleach Report Live a week and a half ago that they could potentially lose three stars if they don't resign any of them back, Illuminar, right. Van Roten, and Andre James. And the other question mark is, is Dylan Parham going to move the center or are they going to keep him at guard? That's another mm-hmm. decision they're going to have to make. Uh, regardless, I think the the interior offensive line market is a lot better than the right tackle market in free agency. At right tackle, you're looking at – in my opinion, I think Michael Nwenu has of the Patriots has the most mm. versatility, could play inside and outside. Jonah Williams is probably a name that's going to come up a lot, but he was average to below average at, le- at right tackle, played mostly on the left side in Cincinnati. But when it comes to the interior line, you got guys like Kevin Zeitler going to be available, Jonah Jackson of the Lions, Dalton Reisner, uh, Tyler Biotish of the of the. Cowboys. So Mm -hmm. the Raiders are going to have multiple options if they want to get a guard or a center. To me, if they're going to, if they're going to upgrade the right tackle spot, I know a lot of people still like their Mumford because they like the way he filled in. Um, With when Colton Miller went down, had to move outside. And when they had their Mumford and Jermaine Lumen are playing, I don't think their Mumford is the, just the unquestioned starter there. Remember the Raiders, if you remember, Peter King's report about being in the Raiders draft room, the Raiders were interested in uh, Paris Johnson of Ohio yeah. State. Yeah. Now, McDaniels, Dave Ziegler, no longer there, but I would assume that they would still be interested in the right tackle simply because Jermaine Illuminar, while he was solid, is he your long-term guy at the position? And I would say right now, no. But yeah. I, I can see the Raiders re-signing him because again, he has the positional versatility and he is he is still a solid starter. A lot of people want to say, oh, he it's trash. I, I saw him going back and forth <laughs> on Sunday with 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 uh, someone about his uh, PFF grade. Apparently, he has an issue with his PFF grade. And I will say, I don't like to use PFF grades as the basis of my argument. You know, yeah. if if you if you if you don't know what you're looking at, then of course use the PFF grades as your basis. Yeah. But I think a lot of players uh, on both sides of the ball disagree with PFF, and some coaches disagree with PFF, but they do use PFF for other things. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, to validate some things or to kind of show a trend or that that there's yeah. some agreement around that or some consensus, if you will. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree with you, too. And I think that they have to I, I think I would think that they would sign one of those. guys. I think Illuminor is the the, the the candidate to be re-signed because, like you said, Parham going over to center if they if they feel good about that. Now, Tom Telesco has to make that thing. The good about thing about Tom Telesco, by the way, is he did draft well when it comes to offensive linemen uh, in Los Angeles. So. He, he obviously knows the importance of it. They struggled there for a while, um, but the, he seemed to recover and get some some good players in there. So we'll see what happens there. If we look at um, the next position need inside the defensive line there uh, on at tackle, this has got to be a draft priority, I would imagine, somewhere, Mo, uh, especially maybe, maybe in the top three rounds, depending what happens with the quarterback situation. All bets are off, depending what happens there. But I think they can do that. There are there are some free agents available too. But I would I would think at that position, uh, unless it's somebody you know is going to come in and instantly make a difference. You know, Bilal Nichols is going to be a free agent now, so he's gone. You need some bodies up there, but you not only need bodies, you need somebody who's going to be a difference maker. So I, I guess I guess I have a slightly different opinion about the defensive tackle position, simply because the Raiders 
I know these were previous regimes, but the Raiders have struggled to draft defensive tackles. They have gone, yep. gone all the way back to Eddie Vanderdust. For any of my <laughs> listeners, for any of my listeners who remember Eddie Vanderdust from 2017, yes, draft class. It seems like going back to that class. Yeah, they've had issues drafting at that position. So I I propose that they should go to veteran route. I, I spoke about this on my Bleach Report live that they should inquire about trades for DeForest Buckner in Indianapolis. He's going to the last year of his mm. deal. He is 30, but he's he ha- he barely misses any time. Still a consistent um, pass rusher on the inside. I believe he has seven sacks in five consecutive seasons. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Allen, who's basically says he's tired of losing in Washington. Washington has kind of redone their defensive line, trading away Chase Young and Montez Sweat. Inquire about Jonathan Allen because he's also a leader, a leader type at that position. Also, in free agency. Christian Wilkins is going to be a free agent. Justin uh-huh. Matabuike, Matabuike is going to be a free agent. Baltimore may not may not let him hit the market, but if they do for mm-hmm. whatever reason, Justin Matabuike reminds me kind of Deron Payne, where he had he kind of built up slowly and then had an explosion year in his contract year. And a lot of people say, well, "Got to be careful those guys who have big stats in their <laughs> contract year." But I think his natural progression, uh, you could see that he was going to eventually break out. So Justin Matabuike and Christian Wilkins look out for those two couple other notes. Austin Johnson, who was signed by the Chargers, uh, I believe, an offseason or two ago. Keep an eye on him. Tom Telesco may bring him to Johnson. Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh, Justin Jones, who's going to be a free agent, uh, played for the Bears this uh, past few years. Tom Telesco drafted him uh, about a handful of years ago in the third round. So also, Justin Jones, also a New York native from the Bronx. But that's not what I'm campaigning for, but he's been pretty solid. He's coming off arguably his best season. So I can see Tom Telesco reuniting with Justin Jones, who he drafted in the third round. It's all about relationships, man. So you're right. Those are those are all great names. So you see what you're learning listening to Silver and Black today? Thank you, Mo. We appreciate that. We, and the listeners appreciate that. Uh, a couple other positions here before we get to the first break. One is cornerback. To me, this is another one. I think the Raiders... If they can get up, if they if they retain a second round pick, which I would imagine they would do, no matter what they try to do to get into the first round for a quarterback, um, this is I think a, a position where they would go there. Perhaps if it's not an offensive lineman, definitely a cornerback. They need that other outside guy. I think um, now you have Jones there, which helps out significantly, and and you can move Hobbs back into the slot as we've talked about many many times. But but I think that's a priority as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Three names to look out for. For me, Jalen Johnson, if the Bears somehow mm-hmm. let him hit the market, I don't see why they would, but who knows? I think he at, at least gets franchise tag. But for whatever reason, if he's on the market, you go after him. Also, Adoree Jackson, mm-hmm. who, play, who was with the Giants, has some experience in Patrick Graham's system, so there's some familiarity mm-hmm. there. I remember yes. I remember Adoree back when he was out of USC. He's one of those athletic cornerbacks. Now some issues. Some he he does get nicked up because he is smaller, but he he played his best ball under Patrick Rams and Lejarius Sneed's another guy who's going to hit the market. Lejarius Sneed forced that fumble we talked about early in the show on Z- Zay Flowers having a phenomenal year in Kansas City. And for some yes, reason sir. they can't resign him. If I'm the Raiders, I pick up the phone and I try to get him to Las Vegas. Absolutely. All right. Running back, we will get into in a different episode, but definitely if depending what happens with Josh Jacobs. I still think the chances, even though Antonio Pierce, the close relationship there, I think the chances of them signing him are probably better. I still don't think it happens, though. So we'll get into that. They're going to need a running back. There's plenty of young running backs in the draft. They also have Zamir White, who showed us a lot towards the end of the year uh, as well. Would you agree with that assessment? I would agree with that assessment. They need to add another running back regardless of, uh, especially, I mean, if they don't resign Josh Jacobs, Mm -hmm. I I think it's I think it's 50 50 now because because with Josh Jacobs, it depends on what he wants. What he takes. Yeah, if he's exactly. if he's willing to take a discount, it increases yeah. the chances that he'll he'll be back in Las Vegas. If he wants to get the most money he could get, probably not coming back. Tom Telesco has to be the one to say, look, I understand Tony Pierce, you like Josh Jacobs, but we have to long term planning. We, yeah. we we're not gonna play a running back north of ten million dollars. I one thing I want to add, Scott, really quick. I know you mentioned running back at the bottom of your roster needs. I will also put linebacker up there simply because uh-huh. Divine Diablo eh, yep. okay. So Robert Spillane has one more year left on this deal. I'm going to say this for the 50 million time. Patrick Go Queen. get Patrick Queen. He's going to be a free agent this offseason. This, this free, that now, now he's on the market, so actually it could happen. <laughs> you don't have to give anything up except dollars. Queen so we'll to LV. Should be there the you hashtag. go. He, he can become the Las Vegas queen, yes. Well, 
Queen of Las Vegas. No, that doesn't sound good either. Anyway, so yes, linebacker. Uh, and then last, before we can do this really quick, but I, I also discuss with folks all the time, uh, listeners, friends, colleagues, the Raiders need wide receivers, man. Listen, okay, Trey Tucker is going to be okay, but he's 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 got a specific role. Jacoby Myers got another year on a, two years on his deal. You have obviously Devontae Adams. You have no speed. And if you saw what happened in the playoffs too with guys with speed, you saw Debo Samuel. You saw uh, what happened with Miami this year, even though they didn't advance in the playoffs. You see even Kansas City uh, with Rice as a nice young player. You got to have some of that speed because you, you need to challenge vertically. Now, you have to have the quarterback to throw it to them. But at the same time, this is something the Raiders don't have to do this early in the draft. Um, and there will be some free agents available too. But but I think the Raiders need to address that position. And depending what offense they get, i.e. offensive coordinator, we don't know yet as we are recording, uh, then you need to also figure that out because you need that speed. You need somebody who's going to challenge vertically in a big, big way in today's NFL. Yeah, primarily that's going to be Trey Tucker. But, I, I, you know, I guess if you want to add a fourth wide receiver behind who can play inside and outside, with speed because Trey Tucker is mostly going to be in the slot. Now, right. if you want more speed on the outside, a guy who's going to be, you know, spelling Jacoby Myers and Devontae Adams. Yeah, fine. Draft one in the in the third, fourth, fifth round. Right. And develop that guy behind <laughs> Trey Tucker and, and the group. Assuming yes. that you're going to move on from Hunter Renfro because you remember you have a lot of money tied into Hunter Renfro. Well, we're going to talk about that coming up. We're going to talk about the Raiders salary cap situation, also the free agents. So who, so who might be saying goodbye to Raider Nation? We're going to take a look at all of those things when we come back here on Silver and Black today. The Tuesday edition, you're with Mo, you're with Scott. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. The NFL Draft is the subject in this segment of Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Scott Branson, Mo Moten with you. Do us a favor. Follow us up on X. Have conversations with us. Don't be a snapperhead, though. For those of you who already follow, you know what that means. Uh, you can follow Mo on X.com at Mo Moten. M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. And you can follow me at L-V Gully. And the show is S-N-B, the three letters, today. So come up there and, and chat with us. All right, Mo, let's get into the, 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 the draft. Of course, we got a lot of time to talk about the draft, and we're going to go through that whole progression. But I want to touch it, touch on it here since it's the, the, the people are starting to shift their mindset to that. We talked about the top priority being a quarterback uh, and, and, and the needs in the trenches and beyond. But I want to look at this because a lot of folks look at the draft and they think, well, boy, if they're going to move up in the draft for a quarterback, we'll start there. There's really six, seven, even you could argue eight teams that are in need of a quarterback. I mean, look, the league is quarterback hungry because guess what? It's the most important position on the field. And so you look at teams that are num that are one through three in the draft right now, which is Chicago, Washington, and um, why am I forgetting the third one? New England. New England. Thank you. Patriots. So you look at those three and you say, okay, well, the Bears already have a quarterback. No, they're going to take Caleb Williams <laughs> unless you give them a just amazing offer. Literally, Godfather can't refuse, right? So there's three quarterbacks. The top three quarterbacks might be off the, the board right at the top. So the Raiders, maybe they can move to three. Maybe they can move to four, five, maybe. But is it going to cost them too much? That's the question. I don't know. Again, everybody's, well, they just got to move up. Well, yeah, you got to have a partner to move up. Somebody <laughs> wants to have to trade out of that spot. And nothing is impossible, Mo. I truly believe that. But I just don't see any of those three teams, especially with new coaches, right, except for Chicago, um, wanting to trade out of that spot when they know how important a quarterback is to the success, long-term success of the franchise, of the team. And guess what? If I'm the coach, yeah, they might be a young quarterback. I got to develop them, but I don't want to go somewhere and not have a quarterback. Here's the only scenario that I could see the Raiders getting one of those three spots. Mm. And it's specifically speaking about the third spot. I understand that all three teams, the top three need quarterbacks, but who's to say that the third team is going to want that third quarterback available. So let's True. say, True. let's say Cleet Williams goes to the Bears and I don't know, Drake May goes to Washington. Who's to say New England wants Jaden Daniels? I know that yeah. seems preposterous to a lot of people because they're just assuming a oh, quarterback, 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 but that third team may not love that third 
quarterback available. They just yeah. may not. They may prefer someone at the end of the first round. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a slight chance, a slight chance if that third, if the Patriots don't like who's <laughs> available there at three, that third of the top quarterbacks available, they may move back. There is a slight chance that that could happen. But let's say it doesn't. I still think the Raiders could could move up and not to four or five. I think there's a possibility that the Raiders move up to, let's say, nine or ten. Yeah, the right. Bears pick at nine and the Jets pick at ten. Why would they move up to nine or ten? Because they want to get ahead of the Minnesota Vikings, who are at 11, and the Denver Broncos at 12. So if you if the Raiders like, let's say, Bo Nix, right, but they fear that the Broncos or the Vikings may pick Bo Nix, they're going to have to jump over those two teams to get him. Yes. which means they're going to have to get him at nine or 10. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people say, well, you're overdrafting if you get Bo Nix at nine or 10. Listen, if that's the rate, if that's who the Raiders feel is their guy, you go get that guy. Yeah. I, I say this every year. We our our rankings for media people from the most, Doesn't you matter. know, for the most esteemed draft analysts out there, their QB rankings, their prospect rankings are different than some of these teams prospect rankings. So you may have, Bo Nix as a middle round, as a middle first rounder, or as a as a late first rounder. There may be three teams who have him as a top ten pick, and the Raiders just may be one of them. Who knows? So mm-hmm. just before you say, "Oh, Bo Nix is not a top ten pick," just remember <laughs> that your draft board is not going to look like the Raiders' draft board, and they may disagree Correct. with you on that. Well, and and remember, Ra- Raiders fans have PTSD from Cleon Farrell, like you know, and some of the overdrafts that we saw during the Gruden years. So, so I understand their feeling. Oh, don't overdraft somebody. But you're absolutely right. When it comes to players like that, we just don't know. In fact, no. the more I read and the more I kind of understand, and again, I'm completely guessing to your point, Mo, we, we don't know crap. We don't know what's on their draft board. We're not in their, we're not in their meetings to understand what the scouting staff believes is the best need for this team. They don't even have an offensive coordinator. So that could change everything too. You get Cliffs Kingsbury, by the way, I wrote a story on him yesterday on sports, not go read it. Um, if you get him versus you get Clint Kubiak, you know, you might need different, you might have different personnel that you think about. So we don't know. So we're just guessing right now, but it's fun to guess. It gives us something to talk about when the Raiders aren't playing, but it's funny. The more and more I read, I I think I, I just have a weird feeling. It will be Bo Nix. It's funny. You bring that up um, because I do think the other, the other three will be gone. So I think that that might be an opportunity for the Raiders to get there, but I agree. They have to, that's the other thing. Not only are you getting your quarterback, but you have to watch your division. You have a division rival who's looking for a quarterback. That's huge. So they have to be able to, to your point, they can't get beat out in their own division on that. Now let's look at the let's look at the draft picks the Raiders have, just to remind folks out there again of where they pick. Of course, as we just discussed, round one, 13, round two, 44. Then they go straight through three, four, and five, and six, right? So 77, 113, 149. So they have a round six pick, number 206, from Kansas City for Farrell, um, Neil Farrell, who they who they traded back uh, in the preseason, right? And then they have three picks in the seventh round. These are compensatory picks, right? For free agents, uh, or the Heron was a trade, if I recall. Gillespie, Tennessee, and Mullins in Minnesota. So they have three. Now, seven round picks, you might say, well, who cares about seventh round picks? But you never know. Those can be used as capital to move up uh, as throw-ins, for example, if you if you're looking to uh, trade a Hunter Renfro or something, and you throw in a pick along with it, somebody might take that as extra compensation. But you look at that; the Raiders have their full complement. Tom Telesco walks in, and he's got a lot to deal with here. He's got the ability to package stuff up, and then that's just this year. Then you got picks next year and the following year. You can also trade as well, future compensation. So when you look at that, well, they're going to have plenty of opportunities especially rounds one through four, depending what happens with, with trading up. Uh, and, and we know Tom Telesco has never traded down, ever. He's never traded down. Now, it doesn't mean he won't do it here, but he hasn't done it yet. So you look at that full complement of picks, and I think the Raiders are in a pretty good position when it comes to entering the draft with options. Right, and uh, I, I saw the commentary that, well, Tom Telesco is not an aggressive guy when it comes, and they're not aggressive GM when it comes to the draft and moving up. And I brought the point that his situation in Las Vegas is going to be different. Remember, Tom Telesco, when he got to Los Angeles, which was San Diego when he first got there with the Chargers, <laughs> he inherited basically Phillip Rivers. And Phillip Rivers was there for a while. And they went from Phillip Rivers to Justin Herbert 
in a draft where they had a top 10 pick and three quarterbacks went yeah. in the top 10. So he didn't have to be aggressive to get his quarterback. He had one and then they had a pick to get one. So it's going to be a different situation in Las Vegas where he may have to be aggressive to get one because the Raiders are, are I don't want to say far down the ladder, but they're 13th yeah. in the draft order and they need a quarterback. So you can't just assume because he didn't move up for he didn't move up a ton in, in San Diego, Los Angeles, that he's not going to do it in Las Vegas because different needs, different team dynamics, different situation. Correct. And 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 folks might not agree with it, but I I, I want to prepare folks because if the quarterback they want, and maybe they have a one and a one A, so maybe there's two guys out of that rookie class that they would really want in the first round or first, second round, whatever it may be and they both are gone, then expect the Raiders to take an offensive lineman or a cornerback, something like that. So I, I think people could be disappointed if, if because we don't know, like you said, if we don't know if the Raiders, if the Raiders have that thing and then they have, you know what, we have Michael Penix Jr. in the third. So all our first rounders are gone. So we're not going to take them in the first round. We're not going to move up. Or if they tried to move up and they couldn't, then they're going to take the best player at the position of need that they have, and then they can wait on the quarterback. But that's why the plan B is so important here too, Mo, outside of the draft, is what are the Raiders, they have to go into this planning season and say, okay, if we can't get our number one bona fide franchise guy that we think is going to you know, be our guy for years to come, what's plan B in the draft, one? Two, what's plan B for free agency to bring somebody in in case we need a bridge starter until we can get a quarterback next year or whatever year. So I think that as much as it is the top priority for the franchise, what's outside of their control, they don't know yet. So they're going to have to plan for that and have those backup plans at that position. So I could see the Raiders sticking at 13 and taking somebody at a position of need there. Uh, or if he finally does it, trade down a couple spots if somebody really wants to jump up and, and be able to get some more capital. Yeah, and I brought up Bo Nick simply because I understand, like, I, while I like Michael Penix, mm -hmm. I, I just have a feeling that the Raiders wouldn't trade up for Michael Penix simply because with no. his injury history, you'd rather you rather have you that have guy to. available than trade up right. for him. So that's why right. when I say in a trade up situation from 13 to maybe, you know, nine or 10, I could see the, the target being Bo Nix. Yeah, and I'm not saying because Bo Nix is this phenomenal prospect, but I think he's the most probable. He's the most realistic target in that spot. If you're going to move up, you don't have to worry about an injury history, and he has a ton of collegiate experience. I know some people look at that as a negative. I don't. I, I think that also helps a prospect be able to come into the NFL level and play right away because they have all of that collegiate experience. So I'm just throwing Bo Nix out there as a realistic target. I know people would say, "Ah, Bo Nix is a bomb. He's he's not a good prospect." I'm just preparing you just in case it does happen. Just like Scott is preparing you just in case they don't take a quarterback with their first pick. It could happen. I also bring up Cam Ward as a target on the back end if they if they were to move back. Yeah, well, um, and, and that's the thing. Remember, remember that everybody's like, oh, Bo Nix, he's so old. He's old. Bo Nix is a year younger than Aiden O'Connell. So, I mean, you know, people say this stuff and the narrative gets, and it's because he's transferred and I get it. It seems like he's older. He's not the guy who's played nine years division one college football. I forgot the guy's name, but he's not that. So, so, and I agree with you. I think he reminds me a lot um, of, although he only had one injury, it was Hendon Hooker, who's now on the Lions, who's going to be the Lion. I, I think has a good shot of being the Lions future quarterback if he plays well next year. Um, he's sitting behind Jared Goff, of course, but it was good because he, he had to sit out this year anyway because of a knee injury. But you have guys like that. Yeah, you're not going to – I think Penix is the guy who's going to drop late in the draft um, and and might be a third rounder. And so if that's the case and you have it there and you're there and and, and you want to take a flyer on him, great. And somebody will. And if he pans out, it'll be great. But it, 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 it all depends on what's going on. So we're going to get into the draft a lot as we go through the offseason, of course. Um, but I wanted to touch on that a little bit just to talk about – some of the needs and to show you what the Raiders picks are again, just I'll, I'll flash it up on the screen for folks if they want to screenshot it too, if they want to keep it, um, which is the full complement of picks, all those co compensatory picks at the end and, and, and the, the, the picks from the trades. So they got a lot of capital this year to work with. And of course they can also work with last year's uh, um, excuse me, next year's capital as well, as you can look ahead there. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, that's what we're going to do, Mo. We're going to get into numbers. My least favorite thing in the world because I suck at math. And that is the salary cap. 
And I actually have a piece up on Sports Not Running today on the salary cap. It was very hard for me, Mo, because it's numbers. But we went through it and I wrote a piece about it. But I want to go through with you and we're going to go through live. We're going to go on over the cap too live here and we're going to play around a little bit like, what if we did this? Boom. And, and show you a little bit of the cap space that the Raiders have heading into the 2024 season. So that's all coming up here on Silver and Black today in Odyssey Original Podcast. Again, don't go anywhere or we will hunt you down and we will find you. We're coming back right after this break. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Silver and Black today, the home stretch. That's right. Final segment number three of this Tuesday edition of the show. And thank you guys for being with us. We appreciate you always. And thank you. Some great compliments with the season coming to end. You know, some people, Mo, not everybody, but I can understand it. We, we would love everybody to listen all year round. Some people, though, they kind of get through the season. They stick around a little bit and they're like, hey, guys, I'll, I'll, I'll catch back in with you when we get to July. Uh, or August. And so I get that. That's fine. Uh, but keep on your auto download for us. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. Just keep letting your phone get it. You don't have to listen to us. But anyway, uh, a lot of compliments, a lot of folks reaching out and saying they'd appreciate it, even though they don't always agree with us. They like the fact that we kind of just put it out there uh, and give you some objective points of view because you don't find a lot of objective points of view anymore when it comes to content around your favorite team. And so I know we sometimes piss you off, but hey, that's why we're here. Just got to you know, keep you honest and that's all good. And we love the discussion, by the way. We love adult discussion, even if it's challenging us or telling us we're wrong. All good. It's great. So keep it up. Appreciate that. All right. Mo, this segment, we're going to talk about the salary cap. Ooh. Talk about money, money, money. money. Right? Fake money but, in some cases. Yes. So the salary cap, you know, it's even for us. And I don't know how much you geek out on it, Mo. Um, I just started digging in a little bit since I did the story for sports, not today. I started digging in a little bit. And even then the story I did, I try to keep it at a pretty good understandable level. Cause there's so many intricacies. And when you talk about a player's cap hit pre uh, cut, pre June 1st, post June 1st trade, post June 1st trade, pre June 1st restructure extent. I mean, it goes on and on. Right. So I tried to boil it down into easily digestible bits, mostly for myself, by the way. Uh, but no, but for the readers too. And we're going to try to do that here on the show as well. But you look at the, the contract status of the Raiders. The Raiders have 15 free agents coming up quite a bit. Uh, they have $36 million as we stand today. That could change. Things happen. $36 million as of today before any moves. And again, notable free agents, Josh Jacobs, Andre James, Bilal Nichols, Amik Robertson, who I still like as a good rotational player. And, uh, as somebody, I, I just love his attitude fits in well with that Raiders defense. Those guys are free agents, and we're going to get into that list, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. But, Mo, the salary cap for the Raiders, I think, you know, they are, they are in a pretty good position. And we're going to walk through how they can free up this space. But I think that Tom Telesco walking in the door, I'm sure he had to look at that and say, okay, can I go there and start to do what I need to do in order to improve this team? Now, they're losing people. Like you said, they could lose three people on the offensive line. But I think it's a pretty good spot, and we'll go through how it's gonna how it can get better in a second. But give me your thoughts too on where the Raiders stand with that that cap space. Well, I think the number one thing if you're gonna clear cap space is Hunter Renfro's contract. I yes. mentioned it briefly in the previous segment. If if the Raiders let him go before June one, I believe it's about a little over eight million, about eight point two million they could save. If they designate him as a post June one cut, it goes up to a little over eleven million. Yes. Now, I don't think any team is going to trade Hunter Renfro simply because he's been hurt and or ineffective, hasn't produced much in the past couple of years. So his trade value is in the toilet. Yes. But it, it seems like he's out of the rotation there. Trey Tucker had been coming along. He brings the speed that Hunter Renfro does not have. That's an easy way they can uh, add some cap space there. Yeah. There are some other minor moves that they can make to add cap space, though I it's a little dicey. Marcus says 3.4 million. Is he is he solid? Yes, but is he a, like a playmaker playmaker, a game-changing mm -hmm. safety? No. Uh, we'll see what, what his future holds. Jerry Tillery, 2.3 million is not much, but who knows if he fits in rotation depending on what the Reds do with their draft. Also looking at, and that's, I would say that's about it because you're not, even though there are some people that say Colton Miller is getting old. I had a conversation. Some, some people think that Ray should trade Colton Miller and let Thayer Mumford start at left tackle and Jermaine Luminar at right tackle. I totally disagree with there. Colton Holy Miller crap. is still in his prime. Leave yes. Colton Miller at left tackle. You're not trading Colton Miller. Yes. And that would make me Moses then, like 200 years old if he's old. 
Holy moly. Uh, I flashed up on the screen, though, the highest paid players, Mo, and you talked about this. Look, Jimmy Garoppolo gone. Uh, Hunter Renfro is going to be gone. Josh Jacobs perhaps gone or at least a different contract. You talked about Marcus. Bilal Nichols will be gone, I think. If he does come back, it's not going to be at that cost. So that's the 10 highest paid Raiders. Then we go over to the free agents. We talked about this. So this is where some of the money comes off the contract. Jacobs, Nichols, James, Illuminor, Austin Hooper, Brandon Bolden. Oh, no, you can't lose Brandon Bolden. Uh, Amir Abdullah, Greg Van Roten, and Adam Butler as well there. So, of course, you can see the money going down, down, down there. But, Mo, you look at this, too, and I'm going to bring up live. We're going to go through some of this because as I was doing the story, I came up with some 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 opportunities for the Raiders too, and we're going to play with this a little bit based on what you've said. So I'm going to share uh, a live view here on the show of over the over the cap. You guys can see that, Mo. I know you can see it, right? So we're looking at. Uh, let's see. Can you see that? Is it there? I cannot see anything. I can okay, see let's my do face. This. Okay, here we go. There we go. Now we got it. Hey, hey! Look at that! Look at that! Look at that! Okay, so what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to take Mo and I off here so you wouldn't do good. So, okay, there we go. So we're going to do this even better, like this. All right, there we go. And we're going to take the graphic down so you guys can see what the hell we're doing. Okay, so Mo, if you look at this page, and I got to flip to that page and do this. If you look at this page, this, I, I love, if you guys ever want to go on and play with this on Over the Cap, it's really cool. You can go on here and say, okay, you can do scenarios, right? So at the top here where my cursor is, you can see, for those of you listening, I'll read it out to you. Total liabilities for the Raiders. And this is all in my story up on Sports Not. If you want to read it, it's laid out a little bit different, but you can you can read it there. $212 million. So that's what they're going to have to pay on, on the books right now for 2024. Salary cap is at 249 or 248.5, actually. And cap space free is 36. This is where I'm getting these numbers from. So if you come down here, you can see on the right here is a free agent. So they don't count towards that number, right? Because they're technically not under contract anymore. But if you look at Jimmy Garoppolo here, so if, if, if the Raiders cut him before June 1st, they only have $19,000 of cap savings, right? 28 million of dead cap. Now, let's say, okay, well, geez, what if you can trade him before June 1st? Okay, I doubt it happens, but you never know. If you can trade him, you save 11 million, Okay. If you cut him after June 1st, you save about 13 million. Trade 24 million. I don't see anybody trading for for that kind of money. Um, restructure, which I don't think he sticks around, but if he restructures, you can reduce his cap. He would have dead money, no dead money, but he and you would save 16 million dollars. Those things I don't think happen, Mo, with with Jimmy Garoppolo. So so there's not a lot of, and that's where people say, well, we'll just cut him. Yeah, and they'll cut him, but there's not a lot of savings there, no matter what you do with Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah, and that's why I didn't bring up Jimmy Garoppolo as an immediate flush of uh, cap space and Correct. financial resources simply because his situation is a little, not a little, it's more complicated than Hunter Renfro's because remember, yeah. I think after a certain, after the third league day, he gets another $12.5 million if he's on the roster. Yep. So they're going to have to make a decision rather quickly on Jimmy Garoppolo, what he, what's going to happen with him. And as you said, I don't think a team is going to trade for him simply because he's coming off of his worst year. Now, it was under Josh McDaniels, and, and no quarterback really played that well under Josh McDaniels. But teams are going to look at his contract and say, we're not going to bail you out of that contract. Either. Exactly, exactly. Then you look at some of these other names. I'm going to get into some creative ones. I want to get your opinion on this in, in the time we have left. But like Hunter Renfro, people are like, well, I'll trade Hunter. I don't think tra Hunter Renfro, he had no trade value last year. I don't nope. think he'll have any trade value this year. So nope. <laughs> if you cut him before June 1st, which is, I think, what's going to happen, the Raiders will will have a five million cap hit, but they they will save eight. So there's eight right there, right? So I think that's the most likely scenario. Right. Mm -hmm. Then then you start to look at the top, you know. So when you're looking at saving, yeah, you can come down here and try to restructure some of these other guys that are that are lower. Like I mean, Brandon Hoyer is a different story. Uh, two million, two point six million. Some of these other guys you might want to restructure. They restructured Jacoby Myers last year. Right. So he's a $12 million cap hit, by the way, for 2024. But I look at this and, and again, you might say, well, he just resigned a deal a couple of years ago. Max Crosby, to me, Mo, is a candidate for for an extension. Right. So I looked at this and I said, OK, well, you could restructure him. That save you $12 million. If you extend him and give him a new deal, whatever that is, because I think he deserves it, actually, because uh, his, his previous deal was 2021. Uh, you can you can save another f almost fifteen million dollars on cap space, well, just over fourteen. 
to be exact. So this is this is a possibility there. You also mentioned Colton Miller. I think Colton Miller, if I'm the Raiders, I want to also extend him, give him a new contract extension. He had a big one back. So now you look at this and you can save another $9 million right there if you just did those two guys, right? Now, I don't know that Devontae Adams would do anything and what they want to do, but they could also do that. They could restructure Devontae Adams and you could save another $10 million, right? So will all these things happen? I don't think so. But I wanted to go over that just to give people an idea of sort of what the Raiders could be looking at. And I think, I think you have two players who deserve an extension and that could save cap money, which is Miller and Crosby. And then if Adams is willing to talk restructure, then there might be opportunity there too. Yeah, I think the, the main point here is you have to understand that when you give a guy an extension, a lot of times it lowers the cap hit for the current year. So it pushes it the it money, forward. puts the money further into the future. Correct. And it's just over all of it really is, is moving around money so that you have flexibility for the current <laughs> year. Correct. And I think pe- I think some, I think some get confused that if a player gets an extension, that means we're going to have less cap space. That, that's not true. Uh, that's not true. So just remember that. And, and it's kind of similar for restructuring deals. All you're doing is pushing money down the line so that you have, flexibility for the current year and the Raiders right. have the options and usually you do those things with players who are your cornerstone roster players like Max Crosby like Devontae Adams like Colton Miller yeah so so you see with those three guys if they if they restructure Adams because I don't think they give him an extension but if you restructure him and you extend Crosby who deserves it and you extend Miller who deserves it and he's an anchor of your offensive line that's almost 25 million dollars right there Mo right now that's for this year and what you say well but then you're going to have the problem down the line Absolutely. But here's the key. This is why it's so important to hit in the draft. Now, you're not going to hit on everybody. okay? but knowing you're moving the money, you're kicking the can down the road a little bit. You need to execute and bring in young players on rookie contracts, Mm -hmm. including your quarterback, because then your quarterback. Yeah, you got to give him a twenty eight million dollar signing bonus. Doesn't count towards the cap. But that rookie quarterback might be making eight, ten million dollars, maybe even less. Right. Maybe five, four his first four or three, four years. So again, that's why it's so important to get that young quarterback, to get those draft picks at key positions that perform so that you can keep those the hallmark players and compete over the next two or three years before that cap money starts hitting. And, and you're able to do that because you've managed the roster correctly. And, and remember, every year the, the salary cap goes up. Now, except, up. with the exception of the, of the COVID period, you know, there's always an increase. So you'll get you'll get more space. You'll get more financial right. resources to make some moves. So, But you're right. It, it's important when you're kicking the can down the road, you got to hit on those draft picks or your short term contract. So the Raiders short-term. have developed yes. a, a, a pattern over the past few years, several years of signing guys to one two year deals. And I remember people were saying, why are the Raiders signing all these players to one two year deals? And what I will say is <laughs> smart because it gives the Raiders flexibility, flexibility. so that you're not tied into these long-term contracts that was a problem by the way with tom telesco in los angeles that he was signing these these guys to four or five years deals and they were only playing one two years yeah jc jackson got booted in los angeles after he in a year uh cory lindsley only played two years out of his five-year deal so tom telesco is going to have to uh address that when he comes to las vegas and and, and kind of conform to what they're doing with the short-term deals versus the long-term deals. Correct. And remember, yes, he's the GM, but and, and he's a guy behind the scenes. And I know a lot of Raider fans know him because he's done good work, which is Tom Delaney, who Tom manages Delaney. the cap. Yes. So Tom Delaney is going to have to train Tom Telesco a little bit and say, hey, right. This is here's how we, here's do, how we do it. Here's right. how we do the contracts. <laughs> so right. so he is an unsung hero uh, when it comes to that stuff. And I'm glad you called that out because it's a very important thing. But we just wanted to give you an oversight of the cap. And we'll go through it as stuff pops up and transactions happen. We'll keep you up to speed on that and and as well. And and, and please go read my piece on that because it's, it's good. I tr- again, I'm not a numbers guy. So I tried to write it from the perspective of not being a numbers guy, make it easy to understand and kind of free up. And that's the three scenarios I came up with is restructure Adam's and extend both Miller and Crosby, that gets you $25 million. The cap goes up to 240 is the estimate. We don't really know until right before the league season starts in March, but it's going to it's gonna be around 240 It might be a little more. I don't think it'll be less, but it might be a little more. So so we'll see what they have to work with. That'll, that'll, that'll certainly help out considerably, and maybe somebody will make a stupid mistake and want to trade for Jimmy Garoppolo. Who knows? But other than that, 
I think the Raiders, are they in the best position in the NFL? No. The Texans and some others are flush with cash um, to be able to go out and get free agents and do all kinds of things. But the Raiders are in a pretty good spot um, and much better spot than even some of the folks in their own division. So you got to like that. And uh, it'll we'll continue to explore that as we move along. All right, Mo, what do you got coming this week that people need to know about? And by the way, if you missed the whole holiday period and didn't get your Midtown Mo t-shirt or, or hoodie like Mo's wearing right now, you need to go do that DC4L custom tees. We'll link it in the description of the video below. Uh, and remember, all of the proceeds from that, we make nothing from it. All the proceeds uh, af after their costs go to the One Nation Foundation, our good friend Murph at Raiders Fan Radio. So make sure you do that as well. We still have the 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 Irish Cannon t-shirts up there. And I think I'm going to, there's a couple more coming that we'll talk about soon, but uh, we're, we're doing it all for the One Nation Foundation for folks like Josh at Raider Dad, the Blitnikoff Foundation, all those folks that, that Murph um, spears up and heads up for us is great. So make sure you go do that as well. But what do you got coming up? Wednesday at 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 Pacific. Kind of go over what we talked about here a little more in depth about the Raiders offseason and overview of some of the primary objective, objectives the Raiders need to hit over the next few months. So that'll be up on Wednesday. I'll have a sports not piece coming up. Maybe I'll talk about offensive coordinator since we didn't go in depth about it today. If the Raiders don't hire one before we're, before we're on on Thursday, I'll go over some of the top candidates and who I prefer to be the offensive coordinator. Again, if they don't choose one before that time. There you go. All right. And we'll be back on Thursday and we're going to talk all about quarterbacks. So we might go through some of the rookie quarterbacks. Uh, we also will explore some of the free agents that are available. Some of them will make mm -hmm. you cringe. Yes, they make me cringe too, but we're going to talk about them because the Raiders have to <laughs> yeah. look at the whole pool, right, Mo? Yep. I mean, yep. you got to look at everything out there, including who you mm -hmm. have on the roster, Brian Hoyer. Yes, I know. So we'll talk about that on Thursday and we got lots of voicemails again, so we're going to get into our Raider Nation mailbox. Got a lot of comments on YouTube last week that, oh, why is everybody so negative? I'm like, look, I we're not picking the callers. We give It's their voice, not ours. So if people call in, if you want to be more positive, call in 702-900-7869. 702-900-7869. Or if you're shy or you got a weird voice or something, you can email us at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's all spelled out. The and is spelled out. Mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Do so. If you can do so within the next day and a half, day, day and a half, I might take some late on, on Wednesday, uh, then, then, then you can get on the show. We will go through that. Mo and I enjoy it. We have, we have a ton of fun doing it. So make sure you call in and check out our Raider Nation mailbag. Look at that, Mo. At we that. have our own image now. Somebody was mad yeah. at me because there's red in the picture. You yeah. were trying to be festive. The holiday season just passed. Well, it's right? it's the YouTube logo behind there. You know, the, the one with the white arrow, the play? Yeah. So I'm like, it's the YouTube. No, it's the, on the mailbox. It's red. I'm like, dude, that's a flag. That's how all mailboxes have a red flag. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm getting. I mean, I thought I was in South Central. Red, blue, you know? Anyway. All right. There you go. It's not a gang thing. It's not a chief's thing. It's a mailbox. <laughs> but we will get into the mailbox. All right, Mo, I appreciate that very much. Do me a favor to follow Mo on X. Talk to him about everything about, except for food. Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. Actually, I agree with most of his food takes. Only, only the mint ice cream thing. That's the only thing we disagree on. Uh, oh, ketchup on hot dogs. And uh, you can follow me up on X as well. L-V Gully, G-U-L-L-Y. Also, check out the piece I did on the salary cap today and Cliff Kingsbury yesterday up on sportsnot.com where I write as well. All right, Bo, I will see you on Thursday, my friend. See you on Thursday. All right, for our producer, Mike Robier, I'm Scott Colbranson from Omoton. Take care, everybody. Have a great week, and we will talk quarterbacks. Yes, I can't wait for that on Thursday. Take care.